Thank you very much, Christina, for your introduction, and thank you all very much for coming this afternoon. Um, I called this talk, What Good Are Ecosystem Services? And I wanted to really look at how useful ecosystem services ideas and approaches are and what their impacts might be. But then, of course, as a social scientist, I had to do the fancy thing and add the brackets. So what goods are ecosystem services? Um, which really sort of implies that we'll also maybe discuss, you know, what constitutes um, benefits associated with ecosystems. So forgive me for that little affectation. So um, are ecosystem services making a difference? Of course, ecosystem services and the ideas around them, the different concepts, the terminology have been adopted very widely worldwide. Um, since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, um, which reported in 2005, we've seen a sort of plethora of different initiatives and different organisations taking up these ideas. International scale, global scale initiatives like the, economic, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Team project. And they've been taken up um, in different countries um, and by different organisations. Now, I've been told since I've been in Australia that, in fact, ecosystem services haven't really got the traction here that they do in other countries, and that's one thing that I'd, I'd like us to explore a little bit. But, you know, commentators have talked about ecosystem services as being, you know, the most important trend in conservation science or as actually prompting this renaissance in conservation. So I'd be interested to know if you think that that's true or if that's... Um, even believable. But what's interesting from my own perspective is that um, ecosystem services are also really gaining purchase in international development. So there's a whole range of initiatives that um, aim to link ecosystem services approaches um, with um, poverty alleviation. So for example, in the UK we have this big research program which is funded by our Department for International Development as well as two of our research councils called the Ecosystem Services and Poverty Alleviation um, Project. And that's been um, a quite major sort of funder of development-related work on ecosystem services. And of course, we've also seen this whole plethora of um, different policy instruments being employed. So payments for ecosystem services um, very commonly, but also in the climate change field, um, reducing um, emissions through deforestation and forest degradation um, initiatives, red, red projects, which I'm sure many of you will have heard about. Even if you don't work very much on the land, you're, I'm sure you'll have heard of red. So I kind of view ecosystem services as you know, the benefits that, um, that people get from ecosystems. And of course, commonly, we think of those as being provisioning services, food and water, being regulating services such as flood protection, um, being um, supporting services and cultural services, perhaps, and that's something that you know Christina and I have had some interesting conversations about recently. But I highlight just um, in this image here that um, in the UK, where I'm based, um, we've had a process called the National Ecosystem Assessment which is basically a, a kind of a mini millennium ecosystem assessment which aimed to do a national level assessment of ecosystems and ecosystem services. So um, we've really sort of taken on board in the UK context ecosystem services idea, ideas in, in, in quite a sort of profound way. And so I just wanted to show you really um, how this is also linking through to policy. So I see that this as... Um, you know, a, uh, an innovation in science and in policy. But remember, I'm talking as a social scientist primarily too. Um, so this is um, just a screenshot from the BBC um, news item when the National Ecosystem Assessment um, published its second report. So here we are, nature is worth billions to the UK. Now, those of you that think that the UK is a tiny little country, doesn't have any nature, doesn't have any wildlife, doesn't really have any biodiversity, might be surprised at this. 
um, that the UK's parks, lakes, forests, wildlife are worth billions of pounds to the economy, and the health benefits of merely living close to a green space are worth up to 300 pounds per year, it concludes. So 500 Australian dollars or more, I suppose. Um, do I have to close these down, anybody? Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's significant, I think, from this um, news item, though, is the way in which it links it directly to government policy. So the ministers who commissioned the NEA will use it to reshape planning policy. Okay, so the Minister for the Environment at the time said, the natural world is vital to our existence, providing us with essentials such as food, water and clean air, but also cultural and health benefits not always fully appreciated because we get them for free. So the UK NEA is a vital step forward in our ability to understand the true value of nature and how to sustain the benefits it gives us. So that's really just an illustration of how you know, ecosystem services approaches are being taken up you know, by policy, or at least rhetorically by policy. And I want to talk a little bit about um, how that might be translated into action and what it means for action. So, does an ecosystem service approach change conservation? And I want to really look at three kind of questions around that. Firstly, does it help us to better understand the linkages and to better integrate concerns for conservation and development? That's because that's really my field, so I want to talk about that. Secondly, what happens when our ecosystem services approaches are applied? And thirdly, what does the conservation community actually think about um, ecosystem services approaches? So I'm going to go through quite quickly three separate pieces of work that I've been involved in recently to um, try and answer these questions. So firstly, um, we would expect that ecosystem services approaches, because they link ecosystems on the one hand with human well-being, might give us real kind of traction on this problem of how we better integrate conservation and development. But of course, this relationship between ecosystems and well-being is a highly complex one that's mediated by a whole range of factors, depending on who you are, where you are, um, you know, what resources, what type of access you have um, to resources. And I think that the kind of early writings and the early assumptions around ecosystem services, you know, assumed a simplistic relationship that basically the more ecosystems and more biodiversity we have, then the more well-being we'll have. And although we know that maybe in aggregate that relationship might have some truth behind it, actually when we start looking um, at different scales and we disaggregate analysis, we know that there's a whole set of very complex mediating factors. And that's what a lot of my work over the last few years has been trying to look at. How can different people benefit from ecosystem services? But I think the one area where actually this ecosystem service approach has given us really valuable kind of insights into how we might better integrate the concerns for conservation and development is in through its is through its explicit recognition of trade-offs. Okay, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about that. And I think what it has taught us is that trade-offs are the norm and not the exception um, in conservation. And these trade-offs might well be between different ecosystem services. And so there's a lot of work that's um, been looking at, for example, you know, when you conserve, when you have a, a put an emphasis on conserving regulating services, what does that mean maybe for provisioning um, or other services? There's, of course, trade-offs between different objectives, and particularly objectives that prioritise conservation versus objectives that might prioritise human well-being or poverty alleviation. There's a whole range of different trade-offs between different actors and different stakeholders in society. So between rich and poor people, between men and women. Um, and, of course, we know that these trade-offs are 
happening over you know, different spatial and temporal scales. So there are trade-offs between current and future generations, and there are trade-offs globally between people who sit in you know, maybe poor, biodiverse, rich countries and those that you know, are privileged to live in, in rich but biodiversity poor countries. So we can think of these trade-offs at different scales. And we've also got quite interested in looking at, well, what are the trade-offs between different aspects of well-being? Because actually, the ecosystem services approach, as presented to us by the um, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, takes a very multi-dimensional view of well-being. You know, it's got those ideas um, from Amartya Sen at the heart of it. So if we think of well-being in these multiple dimensions, it's not just about um, incomes. And so we can actually think of how different um, environmental management or conservation strategies might affect different aspects of well-being. So a classic one might be that my well-being is affected positively because I get an increase in my income, but actually more subjective aspects of my well-being, my happiness or my sense of identity, might well you know, go down with that um, increase in income. So I think that the ecosystem services approach has um, really helped us to, to start to understand these trade-offs and especially to think about winners and losers associated with different changes in ecosystem um, management and conservation strategies. And we've been looking at that in a couple of um, projects that um, we have funded by this ecosystem services and poverty alleviation program. And the things that we've been trying to look at is, well, what are the important trade-offs and for whom? So if you're a poor woman fish trader, you know, what happens to, in terms of fishing regulation and how that affects you, is quite different than if you're, say, um, a male um, fisher or a captain of a fishing boat. Which are acceptable and which are unacceptable? And where are the most likely points of intervention then going to, to, to occur? And how can understanding these trade-offs help us to identify those kind of windows of opportunity for actually better integrating these concerns for conservation and poverty alleviation? So we've used a, a range of different methods in our research. So we used a lot of qualitative methods, you know, interviews, um, focus groups, and then we've used participatory modelling. We've used a lot of um, scenario approaches. So these are some images from um, some of the narrative scenarios that we, we used with um, stakeholders on the coast in Kenya, looking basically at possible futures that are associated with um, different fishing regulations and different types of um, development um, controls. And how we're trying to use this to explore these trade-offs has, has led us to start thinking about what are acceptable and what are unacceptable trade-offs and how that might really make a difference for what policies are going to be effective. So we've borrowed these ideas um, about different values and the types of trade-offs between different values from a psychologist called Philip Tetlock. So he identifies basically two sets of values that might be traded off in making decisions and in this case making decisions about um, you know coastal marine resources in Kenya so sacred values are really those kind of those values that you hold dear that are to do with a set of kind of um, moral preoccupations and beliefs so they might be to do with you know protection of the environment protection for other people um, and your ideas about what is ethically and morally right and wrong. Whereas um, secular values are the things that we can much more easily measure, so that to do with how much money can be made, um, what yields or what kind of um, physical measurements um, we can uh, monitor. So what Tadlock says is that we get these really severe problems and we get these taboo trade-offs which are likely to be unacceptable to people and so they're about decisions and trade-offs that people really feel very uncomfortable about doing because they're trading off 
these secular values, how much money might be made, against these sacred values, you know, the safety of your child or the rights of women. Um, and so the talent trade-offs are the things that really cause conflicts. And so I'm sure many of you have been in resource management situations where there are these kind of intractable problems because actually what you're trying to measure up, you know, are completely incommensurable to many of the people involved in this, in this situation or in the decision. So we tried to map on, map these different types of trade-offs onto our situation and the types of um, scenarios that we were exploring in Kenya. And so, for example, people felt very uncomfortable about trading off um, the income that women traders were able to, um, to generate against the profits for other for the sort of fishing sector as a whole. So actually protecting women and from falling into further poverty seemed to be a quite sort of sacredly held value in this context. Um, other sort of so you know you can imagine that the routine trade-off is the type of decision which is quite amenable to quantification or cost benefit analysis in the bottom left-hand corner, which might be thinking about, well, how do we make a trade-off between increasing food production against you know, profits from fishery or whatever? So we've been sort of using these ideas about understanding the kind of value basis of decisions to get inside trade-offs. So the second question that I wanted to answer was, what happens when we apply ecosystem services approaches. And I'll focus mainly on schemes around payments for ecosystem services, which of course have become quite central to the conservation agenda in the last few years. And I think, you know, there has been widespread support and there has been quite a lot of um, a lot of discussion about the potential funds that these approaches might actually recruit for conservation. So people have talked about hundreds of, of millions of, of dollars that this would potentially um, be able to increase for um, conservation. And of course proponents um, claim that these are flexible market-based mechanisms that they're able to actually provide incentives for voluntary, voluntary and economically efficient conservation. But there's a, a lot of criticism of these approaches. And there's criticism, for example, from um, conservation science, from biosciences, that they really don't account for um, ecological functions. So actually, a focus through one of these PES schemes on one particular ecosystem service doesn't necessarily capture um, you know, all the ecosystem functions that you want to. Um, they, of course, don't capture non-market or non-material values, and they also maybe don't capture the complexity of the social ecological system. And one of the aspects that we've been particularly interested in is what their impact might be on social equity. So how fair might they be? And uh, this illustration is, is just to show some of the protests against PES schemes and against RED in particular, um, which is a photograph of um, people, indigenous people from Chiapas in Mexico, where we've actually done quite a lot of work over the years, and from um, Amazonia, um, demonstrating in front of the Californian state capital, um, where they're testifying about the detrimental impacts of investments in RED um, in their communities. So this diagram um, kind of summarizes our argument about why we think social equity matters and why it should be prioritized more in developing policies and instruments based on ecosystem services approach. So this comes from a paper we published at the end of last year um, in bioscience, um, led by Nanaya Pascal um, from um, the Basque Center for Climate Change. So a payment 
Singapore Ecosystem Services Scheme will have a set of ecological outcomes shown in this, this top square, and then a set of um, social equity outcomes. Now, most of the discourse around PES emphasizes these opportunities and these positive equity feedbacks. So makes a positive um, relationship between local empowerment, involvement in decision making, income diversification, new employment opportunities, access to um, different resources that might be facilitated and caused by PES. And it presents this classic win-win situation, okay, that this then feeds into, provides the incentives for compliance, likely to result in, you know, environmental effectiveness, so biodiversity conservation, watershed protection, enhanced carbon stocks or whatever. It's economically efficient, and it might well, because you know, part of the, the past definition would mean that it would also have to have longer term sustainability or permanence um, effects too. So that's the usual story that we get. We reviewed hundreds of um, existing PES schemes and identified actually a set of risks associated with social equity. So particularly, there's a good um, literature which documents how poor people, how, marginal, how vulnerable people have been marginalised from the benefits of PES schemes, how they might well be excluded from decision making, um, documents the elite capture of benefits, so again the rich and the powerful are able to have um, more than their fair share of benefits, that these projects have sometimes exacerbated poverty, reduced resource access, and perhaps even increased tenure insecurity. But we were able to identify how that then had a negative feedback effect, in that it reduced the legitimacy of the project, which led to people um, actually actively resisting it, um, perhaps um, just not participating, perhaps um, manipulating the rules or not complying with the rules. And that in turn, of course, then undermined um, the ecological outcomes. So the argument we were saying was, look, you know, social equity has to be made central and has to be considered in these, in these schemes, not only because we believe it's socially just, but actually, because if it's not, it can well undermine the ecological or the environmental effectiveness of them. And that's quite counter to the kind of mainstream arguments that say, well, really, PES schemes can't do development as well. And what we need to do is we need to either make sure that they do no harm, or we have to have sort of compensatory instruments that work alongside them. So we really try to say, this isn't just about justice, this is also about making sure that they work. So thirdly, I wanted to look at how the conservation community views um, ecosystem services approach. And um, this uh, is part of a study that Janet Fisher and I um, undertook. And we asked international conservation groups and representatives from international conservation groups um, what they thought about um, ecosystem services concepts. And we did this really... Um, because we felt that although there was a lot of people making a lot of kind of comments about ecosystem services and what they thought it meant for conservation, actually nobody had really kind of empirically investigated this. And we used a range of, of techniques, but um, primarily um, we undertook a set of interviews with key informants, um, and then we used the statements from those interviews to construct a, a Q method um, research technique. And um, 
we then went back to 24 representatives of um, different organizations from around the world and asked them to do a cue sort so that we could um, understand what the different views were. So Q method enables us to use statistical techniques based on factor analysis to identify different discourses, so different subjective views. And from our analysis, we were able to primarily through find three different discourses. So by discourse, I mean a set of shared understandings, a set of shared views. Okay? So not one person would have a discourse, but it's a view that is shared by a number of different people. So three discourses emerged from this analysis of different conservation, of representatives rather from different international conservation groups. So the first discourse was a pragmatist discourse. And you might not be surprised to know that the majority of the conservation community um, agreed with this, or you know, primarily um, were associated with this discourse. So, and particularly those groups who were involved in sort of off-the-ground field conservation and also environmental advocacy. And so this really takes a pragmatic approach. You know, what works? We're going to adopt what works. And we're willing to use ecosystem services approaches. And we're willing to use these market means like PES schemes. Um, whatever actually secures environmental outcomes, that's our overriding priority. Although, at the same time, they felt quite strongly that they needed to continue making moral and ethical arguments for nature. So it's not just about economics, but we're using these tools because these tools work, okay? There was a second set, there was a second set, sorry, a second discourse that was a skeptics discourse. And this was particularly associated with conservation groups which campaigned on behalf of forest peoples and perhaps had what we might think of as a more radical green agenda. Okay, and they were very skeptical about the predominance of economic approaches. So they kind of emphasized value pl pl plurality. You know, it wasn't just about how much nature is worth, but we had to think about the cultural values and particularly the values to perhaps indigenous people and, and also those um, ecological values. They were concerned about market mechanisms and they were concerned especially about the impacts on local communities. And then there was an enthusiast discourse and this was associated with individuals across all the different groups that we spoke to and they were generally very optimistic about the use of ecosystem services arguments. So this discourse sees an ecosystem services approach as really bringing in kind of a whole range of new supporters and new constituencies um, for conservation. It's generally neutral about the moral and ethical arguments for nature. It gives an emphasis to those economic arguments and it's very supportive of market mechanisms. So those are the three discourses that we found amongst the conservation community. And through interviews and follow-up um, activities and analysing these different discourses and the different statements, we um, distilled some implications, really, um, for the adoption of ecosystem services. Firstly, there was this um, perception about the primacy of economic arguments and policy. So conservationists felt very much that they had to make these economic arguments um, for nature. And this was firstly helpful in extending the constituency for conservation. That going to the private sector, needing to raise money from the private sector, meant that they had to make arguments about monetary values. But also increasingly having to engage with development communities, um, they also felt they had to um, make arguments about human well-being. Okay, so they had to 
actually be able to talk to these different um, constituencies. And ecosystem services approach enabled them to do that. And they also felt that um, being able to develop new funding streams, particularly for PES, was very important for them and a good reason to um, apply ecosystem services approaches. But secondly, they also recognised that this was overwhelmingly an instrumental um, adoption. So they were doing this because they felt that that's what they needed to do to get money to further conservation, not necessarily because they wholly believed in it. So this is a nice quote. We sort of use services, but there is still a moral position underlying it. It's, it's being used as a tool without necessarily believing fully. Thirdly, there were a number of concerns voiced about the erosion of traditional conservation values that might be um, associated with the adoption of ecosystem services approaches. So once you've started using these arguments, it's very hard to go back, so they're on the slippery slope. By buying into ecosystem services, you're certainly buying into an argument that biodiversity only really has value when it's of use to humans. I think if we reduce ourselves to those kind of utilitarian arguments to justify conservation, we're doomed. I view with horror the idea that the way you protect nature is through communicating about it in terms of services. So this very interesting sort of contradiction that on the one hand, very pragmatic about adopting these tools because we can generate more funds for what we want to do, we can reach out, we can, you know, innovate in different ways, but on the other hand, actually this might be really undermining our sort of moral and ethical values and the reasons why we do conservation. And there was overall this sort of sense that many people within the conservation community felt that taking on an ecosystem services approach and particularly implementing things like PES schemes was part of this Faustian bargain, you know, that they were really kind of potentially um, at risk of losing their values in this sort of, you know, attempt to garner support and raise funds. So, in conclusion, really, to that rather rapid sort of um, discussion of those three questions, I think that ecosystem services appro approaches are being adopted rapidly both in science and in practice. Okay? I think that's well established when we look at the number of papers that are being published and when we look at this proliferation of PES and, and sort of other ecosystem services approaches in the field. These approaches make the link between ecosystems and people, but in many cases they fail to capture the complexity of what and how those linkages work. Thirdly, underscoring the adoption of ecosystem services approaches, I think there's a whole set of simplistic assumptions about behaviour, motivations, and there's a lack of consideration of context, social dynamics, politics and equity, which may well hinder their success of these applications. And fourthly, we've seen that pragmatism drives the current adoption of these ecosystem services ideas. But at the same time, you know, there's this, un this concern about what that means for underlying values and motivations. So what I would like to do is I want to ask you a few questions because I'm interested in whether or not these ecosystem services approaches are being adopted in Australia. Um, I wonder what you think it might change if they were, or perhaps in other places where you work, um, what changes with an ecosystem services approach. And I'm interested to know what you think about ecosystem services. So I want to just do a little exercise with you where I want to take four of the statements that we used in our QSort analysis. Um, four of the distinguishing statements, so the statements that were most strongly associated 
with those particular discourses, the three discourses. I just want to see if you agree or disagree. So in a Q sort, we would use a sort of Leichhardt-like scale, you know, from strongly agree back to strongly disagree. Um, but I'm just going to ask you if you agree or if you disagree. Okay, this will be a bit complicated to try and do that. <laughs> so I want to know whether or not you agree with this statement. So the commodification of ecosystem services has the potential to undermine local non-monetary cultural conservation and sustainable use values. Sorry, it is a slightly complicated statement, but you might feel that you can immediately put your hand up if you agree with it. Okay, put your hand up if you disagree with it, please. Okay, thank you very much. The second statement that I would like you to consider. The concept of ecosystem services allows environmental organisations to work closely with the private sector. Put your hand up if you agree, please. Okay. Put your hand up if you disagree. Okay, great, thank you very much. A third statement. We must continue to make moral and ethical arguments, not solely economic arguments, about the conservation of nature. Put your hand up if you agree. Oh, lovely. Put your hand up if you disagree. I'm a pragmatic point of view. <laughs> okay, thank you. Finally, the concept of ecosystem services is connected to the corporate neoliberal restructuring <laughs> economy. Put your hand up if you agree. Absolutely. Put your hand up if you disagree. Okay. You are allowed to sit on the fence. <laughs> Thank you. That was a completely unscientific <laughs> exercise. But let me... So, this first statement about the commodification has the potential to um, undermine local values. That was strongly associated with a sceptic discourse, as you might... Um, as you might well have expected. But it was also, so it was a distinguishing statement for the sceptics who agreed with it, but it was also a distinguishing statement for the enthusiasts who strongly disagreed with it. Well, I don't think a few of you disagreed, didn't you? So the second one, that the concept of ecosystem services allows environmental organisations to work more closely with the private sector. Well, that was, as again, you might be expected, might have expected, strongly associated with the enthusiast. But actually, all of the discourses agreed with this. So nobody, well, none of the discourses disagreed with this. They all agreed, but to different levels, and it was distinguished, particularly for the enthusiasts. Thirdly, we must continue to make moral and ethical arguments, not solely, not solely economic arguments about the conservation of nature. Well, you might have expected that that was um, strongly um, associated with pragmatist discourse. Um, but again, actually, everybody agreed with this statement, um, but it distinguished the pragmatists who agreed very strongly. Finally, this idea about... Um, the concept of ecosystem services connected to corporate neoliberal and restructuring of the economy. Well, I mean, no prizes for thinking that this was strongly associated and was distinguished for the sceptics. But interestingly, it was also distinguished for the pragmatists who disagreed very strongly with it. So, there you are. Um, you can see that even within the room, there's a wide variety of views um, on this issue. And um, I thank you all very much for taking part in that little exercise. Thank you.